Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin. Welcome to Real Agriculture. Today, I'm at the Ontario Agricultural Conference and now talking with Dr. Jeff Schusler. Jeff, how's it going? Just fine. Thanks, Bernard. I appreciate getting a chance to talk to you today. Awesome. Well, it's great to have you here. Up from Iowa, if I'm correct. And I want to talk about your presentation. And it was entitled, Positives of Climate Change. And just to prefer some perspective on that, I mean, like, I think we all agree, you know, uh, CO2 concentrations, temperature increases, you know, weather events, you know, we've got some issues uh, with climate change, but from an agricultural perspective, you know, there's some opportunities and we're doing pretty well. That is correct. I mean, most of the average person doesn't hear about the, some of the positive effects or side effects of, of, of global climate change for crop growth. Crop growth is necessary to provide food security for the world. And my background as a scientist in the ag industry, I've helped develop new crops, new, new, new hybrids, et cetera, that can deal with some of these changes in, 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 in the global climate that are, have occurred in the last 50 years and mm -hmm. are going to continue going these trends in the, in the future. And we can talk about a little bit more about that in, in, in detail now. Yeah. I want to talk about, again, you mentioned a lot of things from a climate perspective um, that are impacting crops. And maybe I guess the, the first thing I want to talk about is, is solar brightening. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, more sunlight. Higher yields? Yes, it's a great thing, actually. I mean, crops make uh, sugar out of photosynthesis by intercepting sunlight and, and doing a fancy chemical reaction mm -hmm. and making food for us. And it's a little known fact that uh, the amount of actually solar energy coming down and hitting North America has actually increased about 25% in the last 40 years. And plant breeders and other scientists have proven that that has been associated with some of the really nice yield increases we've observed in the North American continent mm -hmm. for corn and soy and wheat over the last 40 years. Uh, that th Taking advantage of that with the breeding opportunities of these various companies and universities has been fantastically uh, positive and is helping feed the world today. Yeah. Now, your background, of course, um, corn physiology, mm -hmm. plant breeding, you, you've been consulting in this industry as well, um, long history. Well, let's... We're going to tap into obviously your expertise mm -hmm. here. I want to talk about something else. Um, um, the increase in frost free season length. Um, earlier planting, you know, longer season. That is correct. That's one of the uh, observations we've, uh, we've, we've noted now over the last, again, 40 to 50 years that the average season length between frost periods in the spring and in the fall is increased at least 10 days, maybe two full weeks in the upper uh, Midwest U.S. and in, in, in here in Ontario. Uh, that's actually a good thing for the growers, providing a little bit longer season uh, without the risk, <clears throat> without as much risk of those early and late frosts. Having a lo longer season allows the growers to perhaps grow hybrids or soybean varieties that have a longer maturity. They're larger plants. Mm -hmm. They intercept more sunlight. They have more yield potential. Right. And so that's one of the positives that will continue to be uh, increasing uh, in the future based on the predictions. Yeah. You also mentioned uh, corn air conditioning, for mm -hmm. lack of a better term. Yeah. Uh, and that, you know, that ability of a corn crop you know, to sort of you know, pull out moisture and you know, impact mm -hmm. temperature. Um, talk about what's happening there. And, uh, you know, you know you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating concept. Right. I mean, all the meteorological records are showing that, you know, there's a lot of increase in temperature <clears throat> in North America, you know, over the last 50, 60, 70 years. Most of that temperature increase, how, how, however, has been in night temperatures, mm -hmm. minimum night temperatures. The maximum day temperatures in the afternoon have actually decreased a couple of degrees over the last century. And that's due to the fact that our growers are growing in the neighborhood of two to 300 million acres right. of corn, soy, and wheat that when they are healthy and happy are transpiring or giving off water vapor as part of their process very aggressively. That increased water vapor loss during the day in hot summer days is actually keeping our afternoon temperature slightly cooler. Mm. So this is a phenomenon known in the U.S. as the donut hole. Right. If you look at a map of the United States and the temperatures over the last century, most of it's kind of reddish and orange around, but in the middle Midwest where all the crops are grown, yeah. it's blue. Yeah. We've actually cooled off our environments. So that, that's definitely a positive regarding uh, farmers growing crops really well and actually fighting global climate change. That's the positive part of, of that transpiration. Now, the, there is a, another side of that coin, unfortunately, because as you transpire more water into the air, that water increases the, basically the relative humidity and at night, it keeps the night temperatures a little bit higher. When you have more moisture in the air, the air, the air tends to stay higher. And so that's why our night temperatures are actually what are going up more than the day temperatures. That higher moisture content and higher night temperatures are resulting in some fairly intense rainfall yeah, events, bit, right. which is sometimes a negative, causing damage to crops. But overall, 
the positive side of that is that we're getting actually higher annual rainfall now mm. in North America on an annual basis, which is always good for crops. Mm. Uh, another interesting thing is I, I think agriculture and, and plant breeding and other uh, disciplines uh, have the ability to manage to the impact that climate. And we're seeing that now. I mean, you, in your presentation today, talked about, you know, uh, new, new hybrids mm -hmm. that have, you know, significant drought tolerance. Yes, yeah, so I've worked on a project for Corteva during my years of employment there where we screen uh, natural variation, natural hybrids for improved stability under limited water conditions, growing the hybrids in very drought prone areas like the Central Valley of California or Texas. Mm -hmm and being able to identify natural sources of variation for improved yield stability under limited water. That's incredibly valuable <clears throat> for the world, not just the North, North American continent. Uh, so that's one of, the, one of the success stories. My experience is you get what you select for. If you right. select for something that's going to do better in a certain type of stressful environment, uh, Mother Nature has provided lots of genes yep. that are there if we can find them. Yeah. And there's lots of other things going on. You, you talked about, you know, increase, uh, you know, GMO traits, right? Mm -hmm. in increasing photosynthesis, um, mm -hmm. nitrate, nitrogen uptake. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a yield gene, a biological. There's a lot of things happening. There's a lot of exciting technology that should set us up for our success in, in the rest of the century. Uh, yeah, a number of companies and universities are working on GMO approaches to modifying some of the critical genes that are in metabolic pathways for, for corn and soybean growing, photosynthesis, nitrogen metabolism. These are all processes that are very good, but they can be optimized. Mm -hmm. And so uh, those of us in that area of understanding physiology have looked at specific enzymes and tried to approach and improve them. Uh, and there's been some success stories published in the literature about specific genes that can enhance photosynthesis and nitrate uptake yeah. and growth uh, and actually can, can provide that higher yield potential above and beyond what the natural genome has provided us. Yeah. And, I mean, we, and we can even look at the stature of the plant as well, right? Exactly. Another one of the ways to fight some of the challenges we have with some of these intense rainfall events that we've been receiving uh, in the last 20 to 30 years is maybe going towards a different model of a corn plant. You know, in, their, in, in our previous generation earlier in the century, we started using semi-dwarf wheats that are shorter, much shorter than the old wheats, and that helped their yield stability a lot over this last century. The same model might be applied to corn. Corn now is maybe you know, three meters tall. Maybe we can cut it to maybe two meters tall, and that, that reduction in height will make it less of a sail for the big winds mm -hmm. and allow you to drive equipment through later in development, providing uh, crop protection chemicals and, and more nutrients, perhaps, foliarly. So, so that's another thing that the companies, uh, the big breeding companies are working on now is maybe a new approach to dealing with some of the dramatic weather events that are occurring. Uh, as part of the global climate trends we're seeing. Yeah, and, and, and we can manage to this on the farm as well. I mean, like, we are, a whole, you had a list of, uh, you know, management, you know, tactics that growers right. can pursue, starting with earlier planting. Certainly earlier planting is one of the logical ones. Uh, certainly in the Iowa region where I live now, uh, we have lots of farmers planting corn April 10th, mm -hmm. you know, a century or a, a decade or right. even a generation ago, that was May 10th. Yeah. And so there's, there, and there's lots of meteorological data co confirming that that frost-free date is definitely backing up in the spring and longer in the fall. So certainly that's one. Uh, utilizing some of the nitrogen management technology to minimize the loss of nitrogen in the fields if we do have high rainfall events is a good thing, like split applications of nitrogen, don't put it all on at once, for example. There's some new biological uh, products out there that may allow the corn plant to fix some nitrogen by itself out of the air. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's very exciting, novel technology in its early stages, mm -hmm. but a lot of potential for that in the upcoming years. Mm -hmm. uh, you also mentioned cover crops. Cover crops, of course, in my area, uh, e e even in my area of Iowa, it's, it's, it's very good for the environment as far as maintaining uh, that nitrogen over winter, et cetera. But we're so far north, you can barely get the cover crop established, and then it freezes. Yeah. Uh, and, and in your area here in Ontario, you'd be in that same transition zone. If our, if our, if our um, growing seasons are getting longer, the functionality of cover crops will certainly improve. Uh, we'll be able to establish them, get some biomass. They'll do their, their work, provide some additional uh, organic matter for the soil, et cetera. So that, those are things that in a farming operations in this area, there are decisions that could be made in the future to take advantage mm -hmm. of technologies that are available to, again, uh, minimize the negative impacts of global yeah. climate change. And that's, uh, we'll, we'll end it there with your thought on you know, food security. I mean, uh, we have the ability to manage to it, and your, your message was, hey, I, you know, we've got some challenges from a climate perspective, but you're, you're secure right. in your thoughts on, on our ability to grow food. 
Right, I think we're, we're very blessed in North America in general with having beautiful soil, some of the best soils in the world, good rainfall patterns in general. We also have this fantastic technology from all of our universities and industries, companies in this, in this continent. Uh, we can take advantage of that to help support food, food security around the world. Mm -hmm. There are some areas of the world which will have more significant issues with global climate change here in the future. Areas around the equator, uh, it's hotter there already. Mm -hmm. Any kind of increases of temperature there could be even more problem there. So, okay. so it's going to be our growth responsibility to, to really provide that, that security mm -hmm. that the world is going to need. Well, Jeff, um, we want to thank you for stopping by. Great mm -hmm. to have you on Real Agriculture. Enjoyed it. Thanks much. Okay.